NRC is under Section 14A of the Citizenship Act of 1955. But before we go to that, let us first understand how many different types of citizenships are there. Um, the first thing that comes to somebody's mind is, uh, by law, citizenship can be regulated by the parliament, which is to say that the parliament can decide who to give citizenship, who not to give citizenship, to refuse to confer or once conferred to take back the citizenship, which is to say deprive a citizen of a citizenship, are all matters which have to be decided by the parliament and the parliament alone. So none of the state governments can come and say that if a policy decision has been taken by the parliament, we will refuse to give it recognition or we will refuse to implement it. The implementation will happen from the parliament itself because citizenship features in part 2 of the constitution and under article 11 specifically and only confers such power on the parliament also because under entry 17 of the schedule 7 to the constitution citizenship is a matter in respect of which and not just citizenship but also questions of naturalization are to be decided by parliament alone and therefore it does not lie in the mouth of any state unless of course it's political propaganda that we will not give effect to citizenship or any law that the parliament makes so as we understand there are five types of citizenships first is by birth now what do we mean by birth it means that if i was born in india and if one or more of my parents are not illegal immigrants now, what is an illegal immigrant? Illegal immigrant is defined under Section 21B of the Citizenship Act to say any person who does not hold a valid passport first or any person who held a valid passport but the passport has expired subsequently. So then and only then a person is defined as or deemed to be an illegal immigrant. So let's come back to citizenship by birth how do i become a citizen either i was born in india and one or more of my parents one or the other of my parents was not an illegal immigrant so that's citizenship by birth second citizenship by migration if on or before 19th of july 1948 i have migrated from east or west pakistan of course East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, into the territory of India, then I become an Indian citizen. Of course, there are certain procedures to be followed there, but we are not getting into it. Third is citizenship by registration. Registration is immediately seven years. I have either lived in India and I am an OCI holder who wishes to register, which is to say overseas citizenship of India card holder, or I was married to an Indian citizen and I have stayed in India seven years and now I want to make an application or let's say I am a person who was born outside India but to Indian parents. So these are the various categories under which registration is there. Next and the most important one which is the subject matter of controversy is citizenship by naturalization. For naturalized citizens, I must first declare that I am not your citizen. That's the precondition of naturalization. If I am not your citizen, I must declare which country's citizen am I. So that country's citizen, citizenship proof I have to submit, say passport holder or whatever document I am in possession of. Once I am the holder of that citizenship, then I have to come here, disclose all those documents and then stay in India for a cumulative period aggregate period of 11 years before making an application to be considered for granting citizenship again most important point is that by birth only my status as a citizen is confirmed whereas in all the other category of cases let's say by migration it is subject to me furnishing proof so it is again i don't automatically become citizen by 
uh, registration, I don't automatically become uh, the citizen. It is the choice or the discretion of the central government whether to grant that citizenship or not to grant that citizenship. Third, of course, is uh, again naturalization. I don't have a right to be a citizen. I will make an application, that application will be considered on its own merits. So let's look at what is the process of this naturalization because many people have not dwelled into what this process is. The procedure to become a citizen flows from Section 6 of the Citizenship Act itself. Section 6 of the Citizenship Act clearly says that the citizen, any person has to first furnish in terms of the details as are specified in the rules. Now, the Citizenship Act is of 1955, but the rules have, the recent rules which are applicable to the present controversy are the Citizenship Rules of 2009. Now, what do those Citizenship Rules prescribe? It says that you must make the citizenship application in a specific form. That form is Form 8 under Rule 10.1a. So let's look at what happens. An applicant who wishes to become a citizen by naturalization must submit this application along with a couple of other mandatory preconditions. So it is not that I will become naturalized citizen at the drop of a hat. What do I need? First is of course the details, full name, address, sex, occupation, in service, address of the employer, mark of identification, place and date of birth, nationality by birth, marital status, if married give details of the husband, husband or wife's name, father's full name, mother's full name, whether the applicant is a subject or citizen of any other country, principal languages of India that is known by him, details of residence in India, date of entry in India, he has to say I have resided in India continuously for a period of X number of months immediately preceding the date of application he must also specify how many years continuously he has been which is to say at least 11 years now details with address of residence in india for the last 14 years must be submitted from to how many years and how many months he has stayed reasons for which applicant wishes to acquire indian citizenship here the person under the new rules may want to mention religious persecution Right. Next, passport particulars, country, number, visa was valid up to X number of years or months. Details of family members who are staying in India with the applicant. So all those details. Details of pending criminal proceedings, if any. Names and addresses of at least two persons whose affidavit in that local community will attest and verify that this person in fact is a person of good moral character and he wishes to stay here. In addition to that, he has to give a certain set of declarations that his citizenship was not previously renounced or rejected or that he had not applied under any other uh, provisions which was rejected. Say somebody was claiming by birth, couldn't get it through birth, so is now trying through naturalization. None of these things would happen under this declaration. Now, attestation has to happen by the notary, by the oath commissioner, by the magistrate, right? Now, affidavits have to be tendered testifying the character of the applicant and the correctness of the statements made in the application by two other people also. Now documents which have to be attached with the application are valid foreign passport and valid residential permit. One affidavit from self, two language certificates have to be certified that applicants knowledge of any of the Indian languages because of course it does not make sense if I am a naturalized citizen but I don't know any of the 22 official rec recognized languages under the 8th schedule. And most important two newspapers circulating in the district in which the applicant resides which will state that this person is in fact uh, proposes to be a naturalized citizen and if anybody has any objection please raise it. So it is not that easy to become a naturalized citizen. You have to tender these many things. And then the rule says that if upon the satisfaction the central government believes that the person fulfills all the criteria and is also of a good character because 14 years are sufficient to decide whether a person is of a good character or he has any criminal proceedings pending against him. Only then the word uses may grant the citizenship by naturalization. It is not shall grant. Even there, despite you meeting any of the criteria, if the central government feels that you are not eligible, then it will disqualify. But if any of this information provided comes out to be false, then there is a penalty 
which stipulates that you will your citizenship shall be rejected right and you will be the word uses deprived of the citizenship second and most importantly is there is a penalty under the citizenship act itself any person who gives false information which also means false declarations which is to say that i have never applied previously i am applying right now this is my first time or anything to swindle with the system shall be punished with an imprisonment of 7 years right so this is the process of naturalization as it applies simpliciter but this is for and i just want to clarify this this is for people who have legally entered the country foreigners right yes what about illegal migrants do we have a naturalization process for them currently no for illegal immigrants there is no naturalized process because naturalized process presupposes that i am a citizen of a different country and i wish to acquire citizenship in this country now the process that i have described right now is the process that applies to naturalization as on date now there is an amendment by way of the citizenship amendment act it says that the these rules will be relaxed with respect to any person who belongs to six minorities which is hindus buddhists jains parsis christians right if a person belongs to any of these featured minority groups then these procedures or these compliances will be reduced that does not mean that they will be obliterated right it is not like you please come i will hand you over the certificate now what is the relaxation that has been contemplated under the act the relaxation is that the waiting period aggregate total stay of 11 years before making an application has been reduced to 5 years only for illegal immigrants or also no, for legal for immigrants it does not discuss illegal immigrants if you are an illegal immigrant then you have no right of naturalization naturalization presupposes that you are a person who is holding a valid passport but has come here now if you have come here and your passport has expired or is about to expire by 31st december 2014 then one may want to argue and i'm not saying that he is one may want to argue that look here you are an illegal immigrant how are you claiming benefit of citizenship now unless i have given proper declaration that i have stayed here i have been continuing my or i have been requesting for extension by the sp which is to be given if i want my visa to be extended or for whatever reasons then i must write to my to the local district superintendent of police who will conduct a thorough verification and only then will extend it right so what are the mandatory preconditions here the mandatory precondition for operation of this bill is that first i must belong to these six categories I must have entered on or before the thirty first December two thousand fourteen, right? And the third and the most important category is that I must hail from Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Now, this is where the root of the controversy arises. First, inclusion of Muslims. Second, choice of countries. Now, this has resulted into a. Uh, the protests that are going on and also the battles in the court now what are the questions that have that have been raised by the protesters and more importantly i will i will uh, restrict myself to the legal submissions that come here because protesters uh, with emotions running high may ask for other things also which may not be legally tenable so we will only restrict our scope to what is it that is there so first question is if they were bordering countries then why choose only three countries out of all the bordering countries because india borders on more than three countries then why only these three were specifically chosen that's the first round of challenge and why am i saying this is a first round of challenge is because i am talking about this in the larger context of article 14 which is fundamental right if the government is to make a law then the law must be in conformity with the fundamental rights if it takes away any of the fundamental rights of a person then of course the law is liable to be set aside as being completely void now article 14 a challenge could also be mounted if somebody says that the action itself is wholly arbitrary or manifestly arbitrary as, as they say if it is manifestly arbitrary then article 14 will hit at the law and the law will be declared to be unconstitutional so what are the challenges that are being faced first why choose only these three countries second why only exclude muslims 
because if Muslims are the excluded category of individuals, then how do you justify that the law in a secular nation as India, which go which is governed by uh, a socialist welfare committed state, why would exclusion of Muslims be uh, justified in any court of law? If it is not justified, then the law will be struck down. Next, what about those cases in those countries where say Muslim majoritarianism has persecuted their own kith and kin? Say for instance, intra-religious persecution. So the word, if the word is religious persecution, do we f bring within its ambit any intra-religious persecution also? Say any persecution which is meted out by the Sunnis to Shias to Ahmadiyas or other places. Now, if there are these three countries, then why are we not looking at the uh, persecution which has been meted out, say, uh, to the Tamil uh, Tamils by the Sinhalese or let's say to the Rohingyas by the Buddhist majority in state or let's say by the Chinese to uh, uh, to any of the other uh, religions say for example even their Buddhist is a minority the treatment which was meted out to the Dalai Lama or other places right so any of those questions would have a significant bearing when the challenge is made under article 14 now second point which uh, comes is uh, which comes within the ambit of Article 14 is can the parliament make country specific laws? Now, this is a point which is a crucial distinction because India till date has not made a country specific law. This is the first instance that country specific laws are being made in the context, of course, of citizenship. Hitherto, nothing of the sort was done. However, what has happened is that America does it. America has made laws with respect to Mexico, governing certain conditions, etc. So there is ample evidence in state practices in other countries where they have done it. So the question is, if they are sovereign nations and can do it, then can India as a sovereign nation do it? The answer, I think, hinges more in favor of the government. That nothing stops the government from making laws with respect to any specific country, which is to say they can exclude other countries. But now the question which then comes as a sequitur is that while deciding which country you must still be reasonable, you must your classification of those countries must still be reasonable. If it is not reasonable, then it will be arbitrary. So how have you chosen those countries? Why have you chosen those specific countries to the exclusion of other countries? Why are you only asking that countries belonging to one particular religion? Because the counter argument that comes from the government is that look at these are Islamist republics and therefore by constitution they have Islam. If that is the case, then the constitution of Myanmar and the constitution of Bhutan also or even in Sri Lanka for that matter, the majority and population is Buddhist. Why did you include Buddhism in the minority category on one hand and exclude it from those countries? If you were making a general law for all neighboring states, then one may have understood that Muslims and Buddhists were excluded. And then you would not have put a cap on only these three countries and have included Bhutan and uh, Myanmar also, or Sri Lanka also, but you did not. So that would be uh, a challenge which the government will have to defend. Uh, the argument that the government may take is that it is my policy decision, which countries I want to exclude and which countries I do not wish to exclude. And matters of policy decision cannot be questioned by courts of law because these are political decisions. I may take a political decision that I want to buy missiles or defense equipment from one country only. And the court will never question it. Why this country and why not that country? Or sometimes what may happen is that the government may take a decision. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, these are the, I'm merely presupposing the arguments which will be made. What the court ultimately does is for because the matter is today currently pending before the Supreme Court. So I cannot make guesses here. Right. But I'm just looking at the wider conspectors of the challenges that one side will make and the other will respond. Second, the most important is, is there any intelligible differentia which will operate while deciding these three countries? Now, if there is an intelligible differentia, then the law will pass muster. But if there was no uh, intelligent which were or rationality behind why you put these three countries on one side and not the other countries that will lead to a lot of problem. 
now uh, next is dealing with the object of the act object of the act is what is the purpose that the act wishes to achieve now it is very important to see many people are confusing the purpose of the act to be giving citizenship it is not so the act does not confer citizenship the act merely simplifies the procedure of getting naturalized if you are applying as a citizen who wishes to seek naturalization then the process is simplified from 11 years it has been simplified to 6 years rest of the regulations which i had just mentioned which is all the compliances will still apply unless the parliament may by law want to change it at a subsequent point of time right now the compliances are still there so if i am any of the uh, person or a minority community applying for registration by naturalization or citizenship by naturalization i will still have to go through the entire tumultuous process which is to of course submit all those affidavits applications get them notarized have two people to attest for the veracity of my claims have the adver advertisement published in two district newspapers then may make an application before the collector it will have to be verified by the central government so contrary to popular perception it is not as if i will enter into the airport and somebody will be handing me over the certificate ke lijiye aap ban gaye naturalized citizen that is not the case i will still have to uh, undertake all these compliances before that now one may say that the object of the act which is the purpose that the act wishes to achieve itself is manifestly arbitrary and therefore on that ground alone i will uh, the courts will strike it down um for that one has to see whether the object of the act is manifestly arbitrary or not what is the object of the act the object of the act is to relax the conditions of citizenship only by naturalization not and therefore this will have no play whatsoever if you are dealing with the case where the citizenship is by birth by descent by migration or by registration therefore a person who is applying uh, citizenship by birth is not in the same category as a citizen who is applying by naturalization right now uh, that to my mind are some of the challenges before the court why specifically muslims and have been excluded and why not others will pose a very serious uh, challenge before uh, the government and the government will have to justify as to why they took that particular stance because somebody might want to argue that why only islamist republic why not buddhist also unless the uh, assumption is that this is more prone to violence then they have to satisfy the court with the data that they are sending that these are the communities which have been persecuted religiously and then the government also has to satisfy how religious persecution will mean one religion against another religion and not intra religious persecution which is to say shias and sunnis or ahmadiyas and others falling within that so i think that's a tough road to climb but having said that it is absolutely too much to believe that uh, nrc operates with respect to ca and ca and nrc will have a devilish combination of sorts which takes away somebody's right but that's what amit shah is claiming right that before the ca the nrc comes in where everybody would have to prove their citizenship okay. correct yeah. and we are not sure there is a myth that certain documents hold certain documents do not hold as proof of citizenship and if you can't prove that you're you're technically yeah, stateless stateless which right. is why people are panicking especially like people which cannot prove their right. citizenship by way of not having documents right. um what, how does this impact them right so let's first burst the myth that nrc operates on a religious basis nrc does not nrc will ask me if i am a naturalized citizen or it will ask me if i am claiming citizenship by birth there i have to prove certain documents now as on date there is nothing whatsoever uh, which contemplates an nrc on a pan indian basis it says the rules under section 14a say that the central government may lay down the procedure for conducting a pan national register for citizenship as may be prescribed it is not yet prescribed many people are taking therefore falling back on the example of the assam 
right, where an RC was conducted and they are saying that, look here, so many things have gone wrong in Assam and we have a belief, a tangible belief so that similar situation will, help, uh, will, will happen to us and therefore we will find ourselves in a fix where we will be in a situation where we cannot prove our document because we don't have documentary evidence or we will be called upon to furnish document from 1971. Many dates are also doing wrong. So let's clear them one by one. First, let's you quoted the Honorable Home Minister's speech. Uh, let's look at the evidentiary value of that speech before the parliament, uh, sorry, before the Supreme Court. No value whatsoever. Anything that any member of parliament says on the floor of the house has no value. What is said is through the bill. And what does the statement on objects and reasons of the bill states. Therefore, irrespective of how the Home Minister wants to play it, once it is before the Supreme Court, it will be looked at only in the context of the letter of the law and not what the statements are made. One might want to argue that what he says will, of course, have some bearing, uh, but that will lead to politicization of the issue. And here we are dealing with what the legal controversy is alone, right? So I will safely distance myself either going for or against on what the statement has been made. Now, uh, let's look at NRC. NRC is under Section 6A for the purposes of Assam alone. And that was pursuant to the Assam Accord, which was signed in the year 1971. In terms whereof, there was a date which was fixed in 1971. And any da documents which are prior to that date will be the only documents which are uh, considered to be evidence sumptuously. Okay. Now let's look at all those documents. Any period up to 24th March 1971, which was the cutoff date for Assam. Why? Because Assam Accord provided for that date. Will that date apply uniformly to India? Massive no. It will not because this is only for that particular state. When you will have uh, in uh, a nationwide NRC, then my uh, hunch is that this will be the date after 31st December of 2014 because 31st December 2014 is the cutoff date for uh, naturalized citizens also. So if you are making a comprehensive NRC, then you will also have to accommodate them. Therefore, whatever date it is, it may be even before it may be, it may take a date of 2003 because that was the last uh, amendment act. It may take the last census date, which is 2010 census, right? Because the next census is going to happen in 2020. So any of those dates could be there, but most certainly not a date, which is that back in time, right? It may be. If it is, then that also becomes a ground for challenge. But that date as on date has not been notified. Right? Now, so what I'm trying to say is that a lot of things are in speculation. There is no procedure how that NRC will be conducted. There are no rules of relaxation of CAA, which are there, which have not been notified. And many people believe that us, what the example of in, uh, or the instance of Assam will be replicated in on pan-India basis, which I think is too far to assume at this point of time. And now let's also look at the documents that uh, Assam NRC wanted. They said your population census of 1951 or electoral rolls uh, up to 24th March 1971 midnight, which is to say that if your name featured in any of the electoral rolls from 1951 to 1971, which is 51, 61 or 71 rolls right and land tenancy records or citizenship certificate or permanent residential certificate or refugee registration certificate if you were a refugee from a different country and you were certified right passport lic any government issued license or certificate government surface employment certificate bank post office birth certificate board university educational certificate court records or processes birth certificate land document board university certificate post office circle officer electoral roll ration card or any other legally acceptable document, including if there is a court order where your name has been mentioned with respect to the fact that this is your address, then even that will be considered as evidence. Now, there might be individuals who may have no documents. Then what has been given to understand from the press release that comes out from the government of India is that in those cases, their witnesses will be examined to find out whether those people are uh, booked under, you know, which those people are in fact the citizens or not. If that is the case, then I think that may be an acceptable form to work out something 
where a person is considered even if the person does not have documents. So if there are two people who are locally residing, they are willing to testify and attest as to the veracity of the person that yes, X is the person who has been living here. Yes, I have known X from certain such period of time. Yes, this person was living here. He has been living here for X days and X months. And yes, he's a citizen of India because I know his entire family. If there are those kind of individuals, but whether this will happen or not happen will be laid down by the rules. If there are no rules today, how can we speculate this way or the other way is my only question. All I'm saying is that protests may happen because fundamentally uh, the plot is lost on perception, how the people are perceiving it to be. But legally, can it be challenged? Yes. But legally, can it be defended? Also, yes. Whether that defense will be successful or not is something that the courts will decide. Right. But on perception, there's a massive faux pas which has been committed, which, which we can all agree to. Now, the question is that some people also would, uh, the, the pro CA uh, people would say that, look here, how is it affecting any Indians? Because this only applies to, say, people who are uh, immigrants, let's say. I'm not using the word illegal immigrants, I'm saying immigrants from different state or from different countries who belong to a particular minority community as is recognized in that country, not as is recognized here. And whether that the same would have a impact in terms of opening the doors, the inflow of so many people, knowing that we have only limited resources, how much of that will function, even looking at the merits of it, how much of money or resources will be uh, invested, the expenditure undertaken to carry out this massive exercise is something that people really have no idea about. And therefore, they have reasonable grounds to protest and even reasonable grounds to defend. Uh, but having said that, I think the law, there has to be a lot of clarity in the law and the clarity will only come if the rules are there. As the existing rules uh, apply, uh, the government on, on the naturalization aspect of it has a pretty strong case because, because of the rules that provide. So because there are n number of compliances, it is not like naturalization will be handed over. And if there are any benefits or relaxation, then the act provides that the relaxation is only from 11 years to uh, 5 years. What you can do by legislation, you cannot change by rules. So you can't say that the condition uh, which is not contemplated within the legislation is sought to be changed by the rules. Say, if the legislation says only 11 to 6 years, then that is the only relaxation. Then you can't say that you don't need advertisement, you don't need two people to witness, etc. Right? Because if you wanted all of those relaxation, then those relaxation must form part of the main legislation itself. If there is any foul play, it would be foul play if the rules are also changed to give what the legislation did not intend it to give. So those may be even stronger grounds of challenge, but all those things will only clarify once the rules are in place. Today, NRC rules are not in place. CA rules are not in place. And uh, challenges have been made. So uh, that so somebody might want to argue that, look here, we don't have to wait for the rules. We just know that the very inclusion in the definition is wrong. And therefore, we have every right to challenge it. And therefore, they have rightly challenged it. So the challenge is there before the Supreme Court. So let the court decide. This entire exercise will not happen in, in a day. It will take, from the looks of it, it will take years and years. And also the NRC which was conducted in Assam was not pursuant to government decision. It was pursuant to the order of the Supreme Court dated 13th of August 2019. And it was a court monitored um, NRC exercise which was taken. Even within NRC, what happens? Say there are lists drawn. The first preliminary list is drawn. There's a final list which is drawn. If, if you have, let's say, a spelling name mistake, even those people will feature in those lists, right? Say one ID says my spelling to be X, the other says Y. That may, that may be a ground uh, to find myself name included in one of the list. But then there are specified tribunals which are established, foreigners tribunals which will look into all these things and then pass decisions. If you are unsatisfied with the decision, you will make a further appeal to the appellate authority. If you are, if you cannot uh, uh, say win before the appellate authority, then you can always file a writ petition. There are grounds and hierarchy. It's not like the moment your name comes in the list, you will be put into a detention center. 
that's also a big misconception many people think the moment my name finds in the list i will be sent this uh, into that detention camps which is not so um i think there's a lot that people must uh speculate a lot a lot of uh, these things are on speculation i'm not taking it away from the protests i'm not saying that the those who are defending it or opposing it have complete facts nobody has the complete facts the facts are there in the act the act has not specified what rules are they going to bring out unless and until they do bring out there is no problem and there's also very interesting thing that i was mentioning which is that people only saw when the act came into picture which is to say that the protests began when the act came into picture sometime on the 12th of december and 2 3 days before that when the uh, when the bill was tabled before the parliament people did not realize that there is rule 11 of the citizenship rules which has already predicted this situation because it says authority to which application may be made that in respect of an application submitted by any person belonging to minority community in afghanistan bangladesh and pakistan the three same countries which now feature here namely hindu sikhs buddhist jain parsis and christians the six communities which are there in the absence of the collector may make that application before a person who is not below the rank of sdm and this was passed in 2016 2016 december 2016 so this was well within the knowledge nobody somebody could have guessed it that look here the rule has already been made now the act is about to fall usually it's the other way around first the act comes and then the rules are made there and but so i don't really see how people couldn't see through this because both sides the protesters as well as the government they should have they should have contemplated that there was already a provision existing because somebody would have to then challenge this rule also that why for other people the application must be made before collector and why for the rest it has to be made before sdm because naturally if they are uh, people who are coming out from uh, these countries then they must submit additional evidence so it's all in a very gray area but i hope this piece affords some clarity to the yeah, individuals yeah i i still have a few questions yeah tell me um currently do we have any asylum policies in place see asylum policies will depend uh, from nation to nation there are of course generally accepted conventions under which there are certain asylum policies that one has to ensure and live by right but in so doing uh the people who are seeking asylum cannot possibly be kept at par with citizens for the simple reason that citizenship once granted confers certain benefits and advantages the right to vote for instance it's 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 a right which has been conferred only on citizens a person seeking asylum or refuge cannot be given the same right this is acceptable across the moment an asylum or uh, person seeking asylum or a refugee uh, is given the same rights then um, india basically you can change the entire electoral politics of the state you know the demographics could be changed second more important thing is that somebody who is a refugee and an asylum enters the country with the express understanding that when the situation in the home country normalizes the person will go back to that country that is the presumption on which all the laws regarding asylum and refugee function so an asylum or a person seeking asylum or refugee is by definition a temporary person a person with a temporary residence not somebody who is going to stay unless and until that person makes appropriate application now if you have lived here for 11 years you have not been engaged then you will be entitled entitled to only make an application to the government for consideration of your citizenship by naturalization to grant it or to refuse it or even once granted to turn and you saying that the defense for you know people with no documents is that they can simply produce two witnesses who can yes testify. that seems to be one of the clarifications issued but for any clarifications they have to be materialized into rules 
these are mere clarifications today which have been issued by way of a press release please make the rules once the rules are there then i will probably in a better position to answer this question right now i will not go by what is there merely by way of a notification i would want to see the rules and i think that because rules are the one which confer a right clarifications may give you a legitimate expectation but they will not confer a right right of course just asking this question once again i know yeah. you've already answered it can illegal immigrants also be naturalized as citizens after spending requisite time in the country and does the ca give them any benefit for does that let's go back to the definition of illegal immigrants yeah who are defined as illegal immigrants section 21b defines an illegal illegal migrant means a foreigner who has entered into india without a valid passport or other travel documents and such other document authority as may be prescribed by the law or with a valid passport or other travel documents and such other documents but remains there in beyond the permitted period of time if you are an illegal immigrant you are essentially somebody who has stayed beyond the permission then i said if you wish to extend your visa or if you wish to extend uh the period of for which you are staying here you must make appropriate application to the collector the collector will direct it to the sp the sp will conduct a police verification and only and only then you will be extended the benefit otherwise not so if your passport gets uh, i mean the uh, the validity of the passport expires or that of your visa then you have to go back if you choose to remain then you are an illegal immigrant for all practical purposes and then these benefits of citizenship will not be conferred on you regardless of religion regardless of your religion religion has no because see illegal immigrant here does not define which religious denominations may or may not be right but at the same time ca does say that those people because i was reading it in the very language of section 2 ca does say that those communities the six mentioned communities will not shall not be treated as a legal migrant for the purposes of this act that is where the catch is because this will lead to another very strong challenge on article 14 and i'm sure somebody who has read it would have challenged it before the supreme court which is to say that persons belonging to hindu sikh buddhist jain parsi or christian community from afghanistan bangladesh or pakistan who have entered into india from the application and who have been exempted shall not be treated as illegal migrant for the purpose of this act so even those people whose passports have expired or who have stayed beyond will not fall within the definition of illegal migrant and therefore those people will be eligible but still they must satisfy that they have come here on or before 31st december 2014 and they hail from these three countries alone now this will be a very strong ground of challenge that how are you not treating these six people as illegal immigrants because otherwise an illegal immigrant cannot claim citizenship but when the protection or the safety net is taken away by way of the amendment then it gives rise to a very serious challenge this also the inclusion of these words shall not be treated as illegal migrant for the purposes of this act will again be amenable to a challenge under article 14 has been manifestly arbitrary that will be the challenge now how does government justify it is a different thing altogether so we will again come back to those questions why only these communities why were they chosen etc right so say a hindu who's a persecuted and has run away from say china or Correct. sri lanka yes is on equal footing with a muslim who might have run away from bangladesh absolutely. Absolutely. they still need to prove absolutely their they still ha- will have to apply using the process of naturalization if they have to you are right absolutely okay cool um but you are very right i mean this will create a trouble in terms of the challenge under article 14 somebody might want to argue this is manifestly arbitrary which they will 
right now you know there's a lot of talk about how it it makes no sense because it does not define what it means for women for people from transgender communities people with disability how do they go about taking time out to produce papers finding those papers or uh, dealing with so much paperwork um i think it's on those bases okay. where uh, a similar problem arose during aadhar enrollment processes also how does one go and just you know just prove to the benefit of the authorities or the uidi how it is to be done there was a particular provision in the aadhar act which said that if you can't approach the uidi the uidi will approach you and get yourself done so i'm sure i hope that there is a provision which takes into account all these things that if a person is unable to approach then one of the officers would go and you know carry out carry it out on a house to house basis just like aadhar enrollment was done if not then that is a very strong ground of challenge again but for any of that to happen the nrc rules and procedures must be in place first how can one second guess anything unless and until there is a procedure laid down so for example why is it not sufficient to just you know directly connect aadhar to the nrc without us having to go through this process again very good question which merits a response aadhar is given to any person who is a resident which is to say aadhar is given to any person who has stayed in india for 180 days so that resident may or may not be an illegal immigrant where is he from you know aadhar is not a proof of citizenship and cannot be a proof of citizenship the passport could be passport would be right election card would be but i don't know let's see what what they say they have said they have given a very relaxed definition for nrc assam they said any government uh, any authorized government id cards so that that would be one of those so let's see what what uh, the rules prescribe before we uh, start speculating